Well, thank you very much for coming. I know uh, it's been a long uh, day and a long uh, three days, uh, so I'm glad there's still some attention. And I'm also grateful to uh, Wider for uh, scheduling this uh, session. Um, since it's kind of a 30-year uh, session, one can do a little stock taking. And I was thinking, okay, what would I say as the stock taking? And I think the main achievement of the last 30 years I think I can say clearly that gender is definitely mainstreamed as part of the inclusive development story. Um, I think that's widely recognized. How it's implemented is another point, as Jean-Philippe has just uh, suggested, and whether it's implemented is another point, but I think it's at least uh, um, uh, mainstreamed within discussions. Um, and I guess from an economic point of view, um, I think there have been major changes in theory and the models we use. And I would say that the sort of behavioral economics revolution that many people have been talking about, I would say it gave the final blow uh, to the basic assumptions of micro and macro models about sort of individualist, selfish, ever maximizing homo economus. But the context for that uh, criticism, to me, dates at least back 30 years, because I remember that this concept was originally attacked by uh, feminist economic scholars uh, of the late 1970s and uh, 1980s. Uh, but uh, their criticism was sort of viewed as uh, maybe uh, inopportune, um, fringe, uh, because the underlying economic models uh, didn't really uh, allow for it. Uh, so I think now, but having said that, I would say even 30 years ago, it, it was recognized that in many situations, economic situations and development situations, men and women behave differently as groups, as individuals, in households and families. And so I would say that it is in common and expected now to ask how a policy or uh, an economic change, a change process, um, might affect the opportunities and constraints of different groups, rich, poor, rural, urban, uh, caste, ethnic groups, and genders. And it's not just women that are the focus of uh, gender uh, economics these days. Uh, it, for example, in herding societies, people are very concerned about, uh, about young boys not being able to go to school. And uh, so there are situations in which uh, males are disadvantaged. Nonetheless, I would say in low-income uh, countries, uh, where many of us are now focusing most of our concern, uh, the vulnerable, those most vulnerable, among the lower income groups within low income countries tend to be women. And so my focus today is on uh, women. Now, um, uh, I'm going to talk about a particular aspect of economic development, which is the economic transformation process. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk about uh, gender and the economic transformation process. And Economic transformation, I've defined it up there. Um, economic transformation is a process that creates a particularly desirable form of economic growth and development uh, because it's, a, it's viewed to be as a more sustainable um, growth. And so that's where a lot of the focus of growth policy, of macro policy, and of my, the micro foundations underlying it uh, is now focused. And it's a process, right? Um, it involves a lot of different policies and events that create this process. So in a way, it's kind of artificial to ask, okay, who's gonna benefit? Will it reduce poverty? Will it increase incomes? Will women benefit? But at the same time, since it's now such a critical process, it seemed important to ask whether the distribution of winners and losers that one finds with any social, economic, political process 
uh, will have a gender bias. Now, there is a long literature on gender inequality and growth and growth and gender inequality, so it's a literature that goes both ways. There's a literature on gender and trade, and there's a more broad literature on gender and globalization, but I didn't find a particular literature on this topic, so when uh, ODI asked me to do a paper on it, I was uh, quite intrigued to ask the question, what about economic transformation and gender? So the question that I am posing is how might the transformation affect the opportunities of poor and middle class women in low income countries? Now I'm posing the question of the opportunities. I am not posing the question of gender equity. I am not asking across a number of variables, will the gap widen or not? I'm focusing more on opportunities. Uh, and the reason is because <laughs> at least that was seemed somewhat tractable. <laughs> That would be the main reason. Um, so now what I'm going to present to you is a kind of a framework that I developed and some evidence I pulled out from the literature on what we might expect. Um, so the framework, uh, I start by thinking about the main female roles in, um, in developing countries. And of course, most people and most economists think about females in market work, otherwise known as labor force participation. Um, but, of course, women have a very important role, a dominant role, uh, in, the in terms of time, for sure, in the care economy, right? Household work. Uh, then you can think about females as children and adolescents and whether they'll benefit, whether the process of transformation will benefit, will bring them more opportunities, both to, uh, to during the process and in the future. And then as individuals, consumers, and citizens. And the citizens aspect also goes back to the human rights aspect as well, raising the question that Jean-Philippe just posed, will an economic transformation process uh, bring more uh, uh, rights and, uh, for women? And, and reduce the norms that uh, uh, reduce opportunities and pose constraints. Okay, so um, let's see. Um, I have no idea if you can read this, but that, and I apologize that it's so small, but I couldn't figure out a way to break up this chart. But in this chart, what I've done is I've kind of laid out my framework and how I applied it. So the first thing is I talked about various outcomes that we might expect from economic transformation in this table in, this, in the realm of market work. And then I talked about the possible effects on females, and then I talked, I made a judgment on the probability of the direction of impact on females' opportunities. Okay, so the first outcome people mostly think about from economic transformation is expansion of employment. And I separate out tradables and non-tradables. I do that because uh, economic is, uh, trading and the trade sector and um, increased um, uh, access to the global economy is often viewed as a critical element within transformation. So that's one reason I separate it out. Um, okay, so um, the first thing is that it is well known that there are, there are gendered sectors and gendered occupations. So in every country of the world, you will find occupations where you have more men and occupations where you have more women. They are not the same all over the world. But there, are, there has been a literature on gender and trade that shows, for example, that the garment sector uh, tends to be female dominated and the electronic sector. And the explanation for it is that women have smaller hands. But somehow those smaller hands don't seem to be useful for the repair sector, for example, or other sectors which require manual dexterity. So um, it is uh, uh, kind of a, an interesting thing, but I sort of take this gendered occupational segregation as expected. Uh, because as I said, you know, you can look at the most gender, if you have your gender indexes, you can look at your most uh, highest gender index society and you still see a high amount of gender segregation in occupations. Okay, so the first, whoops, I didn't want to do that. Okay, uh, the first thing I talk about is that, um, you know, 
for example, one aspect of economic transformation that people tend to focus on is an increase in the light manufacturing sector. And that will probably increase uh, employment that may favor women. So it may increase the demand for labor from women, a female-specific increase in labor demand. And I suggested, uh, the evidence seems to suggest that that would probably be positive in earnings, hour work, hours work, possibly in job security compared with the sector that they're currently working in, which may be agriculture, may be self-employment, which has uh, much less job security. Um, but you know, it depends on which part of the light manufacturing sector. So the evidence is that, for example, food processing uh, does not employ a lot of women. So it will depend on whether it's garments like Bangladesh or food processing or, or what. Um, and in general, an increase in, in output of tradable services does not increase demand for female labor. So um, because of the skill gap, and so that means that if females, if, if, if as is happening in many countries in sub-Saharan Africa, where the economic transformation is moving uh, in the direction of services, uh, in order for women to benefit through this employment effect, they need to have those skills and they need to have access to opportunities to build those skills. Um, and also, for example, there's evidence from Mexico that uh, NAFTA, uh, the NAFTA treaty, which uh, increased the demand for um, higher skilled labor, so men benefited more. Um, however, in the sectors, uh, because men had the skills, women didn't have the skills to compete. At the same time, what the trade uh, in the sectors where women were working with alongside men, uh, at, in the lower skilled sectors, actually the gender wage gap decreased. So there is some evidence that even where women don't have the skills, um, there can be some benefits. Now, what about employment in the non-tradable sectors? So again, the non-tradable sectors are a mixed bag. The construction sector, which would be expected to expand and has expanded a lot in Africa, um, tends to have low female participation. In South Asia, it tends to have female participation, but primarily in the very lowest skilled, lowest paid jobs, you know, carrying rocks around and breaking them and whatever. Uh, um, now, public supplied services, another non-tradable sector, tends to employ more females. So uh, I don't have time to go through all of this, but the, one of the main issues, one of the main variables that depends on whether females benefit is what sectors expand, are those sectors that are gonna expand female, demand for female labor, uh, and, uh, and there, are they sectors where women would earn higher earnings than they are in the sector where they're now working? Um, or will they move into sectors that men have been in? For example, um, when the mining sector uh, expands, expanded in uh, some countries, the evidence suggests that the men moved into the mining jobs and the women moved into some of the um, non-farm enterprises that the men had been running and they ha were also got higher earnings. Now, there is a possibility that, um, and then what about Agri the agriculture sector, which is a sector where uh, uh, a large section of the labor force, men and women, are employed. What if economic transportation, economic transfer transformation involves a process of raising productivity in that sector? Well, again, um, this will depend. My expectation, based on the evidence, is that men tend to get those commercial agricultural opportunities first. Uh, but, again, um, there, as we will see, there is a scope uh, for, for policy. So I guess what I'm saying is in areas where there already are existing gender gaps and women are losers, uh, ha which has been shown to be in smallholder agriculture, for example, um, it's not clear whether those gaps will, uh, will reduce or stay the same or increase. Um, and in, but in sectors where uh, the demand for female labor may be expected to improve, uh, we can expect some positive um, effects on, uh, on women's economic opportunities. Okay, what about the care economy and children? 
time use and housework. So uh, as probably all of you know, uh, women in low-income countries spend a lot of time on housework. Uh, they spend, so uh, in some of these time use studies, uh, somebody showed that, I think it was Pakistan, that in Pakistan, um, in Sweden, comparing Sweden with Pakistan, uh, men and women spend almost, well, the household spends about the same total amount of time caring for children. So there don't seem to be any labor-saving processes uh, that can be invoked in caring for children. Uh, but in terms of the other aspects of the care economy, cooking, cleaning, um, fetching, wa getting water, uh, these other aspects, um, uh, women in Pakistan spend three times as much time as in Sweden. Why? Because women, Swedish women have stoves and washing machines and you know, whatever, right? Um, so one uh, uh, possibility is that if household income rises with economic trans transformation, there may, that household income may be spent on um, you know, uh, products and services that reduce the burden of the care, the work of the care economy on women. It may not be. It depends on intra-household bargaining and preferences and, and what, what women control. And again, if women are making the money, are, are, are able to earn the money, uh, then the household may value their labor more and the preferences may change for some of this labor uh, intensive products. So this is an area where we might see women gaining. Um, there could be lower fertility and evidence has shown, for example, and the evidence comes mostly, I have to say, from Bangladesh. The garment industry in Bangladesh has been so heavily studied. But, in, uh, but not just that, but also the, uh, what's it called, call center uh, industry in India. Both of those, uh, expansion of both of those sectors has been shown to reduce early marriage and fertility uh, um, among young women. And this has a positive health effect. Um, and a, uh, and a lower, uh, it lowers uh, fertility, less children to care for. This also has a positive health effect for women and lowers the burden of child care. But, of course, the question is, will there be a reduction in the care economy work or not? You know, one reason women tend to be in agriculture is they can co-produce. They can work at home and they can create some economic value as well. And they can have more flexible time. That's one reason why women tend to be in informal sector in general. And if um, more market work uh, puts more rigidities on their time, um, then this could increase the time poverty. And this could have negative effects. And it depends on, on, the, on the response of the household. Does the response of, is the, is the household able to purchase more services or not? Um, is, uh, uh, does the, do the younger children pick up the slack? Does the mother pick up, the, or the grandmother, who picks up the slack uh, with the increased hours of work, of, uh, in the, of market work of women? Okay, so then, um, Another way of looking at this question is children and adolescent outcomes. And here in general, we expect it to be positive primarily because of the income effect. So economic transformation should lead to higher earnings and this should lead to better uh, human, ca uh, more money to spend on human capital for the children. But there is some, and it, and it should also, the, f the fact that women's uh, uh, labor is now, has a higher market price, has been shown in a number of studies to lead to uh, uh, increased spending on uh, children, increased enrollment in education, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there's definitely been a, a lot of evidence uh, about that. Um, but there's also some evidence, again, about reduced health outcomes from children coming from the inflexibility of the health system relative to women working and the inflexibility of their hours of work. Uh, 
And in particular, there was a study in uh, Colombia that showed that uh, when uh, uh, the, uh, the garment sector expanded, uh, actually women were less likely to take their kids for vaccination. Why? Because the health sector made them wait all day and they couldn't afford to take a day off of work. So if the services are not uh, responding to the time poverty of women, uh, there could also be negative outcomes for children. So finally, we have women as individuals, consumers, citizens, and adults. And, you know, I think there's a lot of discussion about whether increased earnings brings increased female empowerment, increased self -emp and power and agency within the household and the community. And I would say the evidence is, the evidence from South Asia is strong and the answer is yes. Uh, the evidence from other regions is not so strong. Uh, so, I mean, it may be if you start from a kind of a lower threshold, you can, uh, you can gain it completely. Um, but I think it, it will depend on some of these norms and issues. Um, there's evidence that increased uh, cash earnings and employment increases civic participation. Um, it may improve mobility. Bottom line, we don't really know. Uh, but I think the important point is that in addition to all the policies that we all know should be part of the standard policy recommendation, there are additional areas that are even more important when we consider the question of what are, are we getting economic transformation and how do we make that inclusive. And I uh, focused on agriculture. I focused on worker health in factories, which uh, actually uh, some evidence suggests is a management issue. And so, uh, and I focused on female entrepreneurship and access to finance. But I would also, uh, uh, and there, I would also uh, say that, um, so in sum, the transformative growth ha does have huge potential upsides. One area we haven't had a chance to talk about is migration, however. Uh, economic transformation tends to go with urbanization. Uh, urbanization in general tends to be the gateway for economic transformation. Okay, that means more people in urban areas, moving to urban areas, rural urban migration. In some countries, families migrate. In some countries, individuals migrate. This will be different. Uh, this will have different gender effects. Um, and in general, if the family migrates, it's better for women than just if the male migrates. Um, and there's some uh, scholarship that suggests that females increased value in the labor market creates the conditions for human rights legislation. And the theory is that men now care about their daughters. They don't care about their wives, but apparently they care about their daughters and their daughters' opportunities. This is scholarship primarily from the US, um, but uh, anyway, that's the theory. But the most important, but the one I wanna continue to highlight is the failure to do things the government ought to be doing, right? Running a decent healthcare system, uh, providing access to water, providing sanitation, providing safe transportation and mobility options will uh, make things worse. I think there's also some important issues for adolescent females, so they're ready to take advantage of the opportunities. We don't have time to talk about that because I think I'm running out of time. We can talk about that later. Uh, I think there's a lot of area where we need more research. I would say that most of the research I dug up was primarily on South Asia. There's not much on Africa or East Asia. Uh, I think we should learn, try to learn, what we can learn from sub-Saharan African economies on this range of issues, where they've some that have started to transform. I think we should see what we can learn from Indonesia and Malaysia, which have had particular kinds of transformation. Malaysia's had a transformation of a natural resource economy, which is more similar to, to Africa than, say, Bangladesh. Um, what can we learn from Brazil or Mexico? Um, the research of Bloom about management really matters. Uh, uh, will this lead to better treatment of women in factories? Uh, you know, um, the scholarship says that the women, the, the women working in the garment in the bank, 
in garment industry in Bangladesh are really happy that they have the job, that they've had more power and agency, that they've been able to, and that in the villages where the women come from, the went more, there's been a spillover effect and went more women go to school and the female children go to school. And in, in China, once the, w once the females had a chance to go into the um, light manufacturing index, fathers started sending their, girls to school more and paying school fees, et cetera. But um, the question is, those jobs are still kind of bad jobs. And they can damage the health of women. And uh, we need to see whether management can change it. And then I think we need to think about how to reduce gender-based violence, which tends to be a consequence of uh, increased female mobility. And so we have to think about that. OK, enough. Thank you. Thank you.